Uh, talking about um, stabilizing systems and all that, Nick Dwyer from Seakeeper has first heard about Seakeeper in the winter of 2015. After taking a ride on a Seakeeper demo boat, he realized the incredible impact that the product would have not only on fishing, but the entire boating industry. And he joined the team as a dealer account representative in 2016. He's covered various territories in the southeast, overseen more, overseen more than 150 refits. And from the other system, Quantum. Christian Schoenfield is an engineer who's provided strategic and innovative solutions to engineering applications and projects in a variety of industries, proven ability to effectively lead teams, projects from the start to finish, and to build and secure broad client bases, experience a full range of engineering specialties from design to installation. So, and uh, Christian? Not there. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, give him a nice round of applause. Afternoon. How y'all doing? Good. With my uh, to the PowerPoint. How many of you guys have heard of Seakeeper? Good. Have clients have it on it. Good. All right. Today I'm going to be talking about stabilization maintenance with the Seakeeper. Um, thank you for being familiar with it, because as you said, I am on the sales side of it. A little brief history with me. I've covered the Gulf of Mexico um, as well as where my current position. I cover the East Coast of Florida as well as the Caribbean. Um, I do all refits, so any of you guys out there that have dealt with the, the dealers on the service side and are mad at them for some reason, come talk to me after. I'll go go get them in shape. So there's my info there. So basically what we're going to do today when we're talking about maintenance, I'm going to give you a, a basic company profile, kind of let you know where we are now, how we got there, where we're going, um, how that plays in the service. We're going to talk about some basic gyro principles, just give, give you guys a refresher course on how it works so you can relay that to your customers. And then we're going to go into the basic uh, maintenance principles. Um, to truth be told on the Seakeeper, there's really not a whole lot of maintenance that you have to worry about. So we have four regional sales and service hubs across the globe, uh, most locally here in Fort Lauderdale. We have uh, our sales team is based out of it, as well as our, our factory tech team is based out of it. We have four factory technicians that run out of our Fort, La Fort Lauderdale office. They cover all of Florida. They, they're, I think we've got a guy up right now in Orange Beach for the big billfish tournaments up there. They go to the Bahamas. They go anywhere our boats are. Um, we also have hubs out in the UK. Again, sales and service there. We have hubs down in, uh, we have a brand new office in Italy and then also in Singapore. So as, as we get uh, bigger and bigger, we're still somewhat of a new company. Uh, this year, 2018, marks our 10th year of shipping units. And so to date, over these past 10 years, we have now shipped over 6,500 gyros. This number is going to grow even more. What we're forecasting as we get into that smaller boat market is that in the year 2021, we're expecting to ship 10,000 units in that year alone. So obviously, having service support across the globe becomes ever more important. Nice little graphic there, show you where they go. And so leading right into that, uh, with all these units going out in the field, we have a, uh, a dealer network that we are extremely confident in and that it's ever growing. Uh, across the globe right now, we have uh, more than 150 dealers, pretty much in every major continent except Antarctica. So no matter where your boat is at or where your customer's boat is at, we should have somebody there that should be able to support them. Um, also, another note on that is here in Florida, we actually have two what we call Seakeeper Elite dealers. These are companies where 100% of their business is Seakeeper service work and installations. Um, with everybody in this room, I assume most of you guys are, if not all, are from Florida. I highly suggest that these guys come to your best friend. So basic gyro principles, we're going to go over just basically how it works, how the gyroscope works, and that's going to kind of lead into the service points we're going to talk about here in a little bit. So the biggest key here, is my light, is we have the sphere, and inside that sphere there's a flywheel spinning at a high rate of speed. All right, and so that flywheel is spinning inside that sphere at a high rate of speed, mounted on a vertical axis, and it's gimbaled port and starboard to our frame, and the frame is then mounted to the boat, either it's adhered to the boat or it's bolted straight in. So what happens is when that flywheel spins inside that sphere, it's creating a lot of stored energy, a lot of stored inertia. Whenever the boat starts to roll, port and starboard, you'll notice that sphere will swing or it'll process fore and aft. When it makes this procession motion, it takes all that stored energy from the, the flywheel and it transfers it 90 degrees between both our gimbals, port and starboard, essentially grabbing the boat and stopping it from rocking. 
Another key note here, um, this is going to be my first service point, is inside that sphere is the flywheel, the bearings, and the motor. These are the most important components to the sea keeper. The nice thing about that is because we've spent that, that flywheel over 500 miles an hour, we spin it in a vacuum. So since we can't break the vacuum, it's completely sealed off from the marine environment. There is no service required in the sphere. So our basic portfolio today in the recreational line, we have seven products. Let's go from the Seakeeper 2 up to the Seakeeper 35. A couple quick notes here, the Seakeeper 2 and the Seakeeper 3, there are new babies. If you guys were here last year, you know Grant talked about the Seakeeper 3. I believe in that video he talked about we're shipping it that same week of the seminar. Same thing here. Today we're starting to ship, ship the Seakeeper 2. They're covering boats this, between the 2 and the 3 from 27 now to 40 foot boats. And we only plan on getting smaller. Also, both the Seakeeper 2 and the Seakeeper 3 are 12 volt DC units. The Seakeeper 6 up to the Seakeeper 35 are all AC powered. Um, another note, uh, if you guys have any questions, you know, all these units you can spool up on shore power. So you have time, by the time you get it spool up on shore power, if you want to do it while you're loading the boat, there's time to flip it over to uh, either your, your gen set or to the batteries uh, once you leave, leave the dock. We also have the Seakeeper HD lineup in this portfolio. We have four units. Uh, the service points on the HD lineup are the same as on the recreational lineup because they're the same units. All we did for the C with the Seakeeper HD products is we took, for example, to make the Seakeeper 9 into a 7HD is we detune that flywheel spinning inside. So we lose about 20% on the overall stabilization horsepower, but we gain a 400% longer lifespan. So your heavy duty fishing guys are putting more than 1,000 1, hours on the boat a year. Your uh, commercial, you know, the guys running out to the oil fields or your heavy military guys, this is what these products are for. And again, same units as the recreational line, they're detuned, so they have the same service points on them. I suggest everybody get their phones out. This is the most important slide here. Uh, it has all of our service contacts on it. If you guys call me after this, say, hey, Nick, you know, I'm throwing a code on the boat. I have service issues. My client has service issues. I'm going to directly refer you to one of these guys um, because they don't allow me to handle that. So up in the top left corner, we have Kevin Zervos. He's our global field service manager. He oversees all of service and all of training throughout the world. Uh, he's actually based down here in our Fort Lauderdale office. Beneath him is Mr. Alex Patricio. Alex Patricio is the service manager of the Americas. Um, so North, Central, South America. He's based out of our Maryland office. And then uh, most local here is Aaron Bridges. Aaron is based out of our Fort Lauderdale office, and he is our Southeast service coordinator. So more than likely, if you guys have a customer that's having service issues on the boat, somebody's going to end up talking to Aaron, and Aaron is going to help you guys diagnose it. And then he's either going to dispatch uh, one of our local, our Seakeeper techs, if it's an in-warranty service, if it's not a warranty service, more than likely it's going to be getting in touch with one of our local dealers. Is everybody good on this? All right. So the brake system. So we went over the basic uh, RO principles. So now when I tell you guys of that sphere with the flywheel in it, precesses fore and aft to counteract to help eliminate bolt roll, there's nothing that we're doing to, ma to make that sphere or precess fore and aft. That's simply a gyroscope being a gyroscope, gyroscope, and it's an uh, output motion, counteracting an input motion, which would be the waves of the boat roll. So what we do is we have what's called an active brake system. And with this active brake system, we have hydraulic uh, brake cylinders on the side, and these are going to pressurize or depressurize to control that, uh, that sphere precession. So for example, if you're in heavy seas, we want to optimize the amount of stabilization you're getting from the gyroscope uh, no matter you know how long the wavelength is. So for example, your heavy seas, your four to six is maybe a six second wave period. Those rams are gonna pressurize and it's gonna slow down that gyroscope. So it, it's spinning throughout the whole wave, or it's, sorry, precessing throughout the whole wave period, giving you the optimal amount of stabilization through the whole wave period. You guys come in the inlet, you're in the ICW, you got a 50 foot Viking that goes by, you know, one to two foot chop, whatever it throws. Those rams will depressurize because it's much smaller sea and allow it to swing a lot faster, releasing that torque over a shorter period of time. Um, now, what controls these? Great question, guys. Uh, so what controls these, the pressurization in the cylinders, is these accumulators here. These accumulators come pre-charged from the factory, uh, both at 225 PSI 
Um, and obviously you see there's two there, one for each brake cylinder. On the bigger units, the C Keeper 16 to the 35, there's actually four hydraulic rams on it, so there'll be four accumulators. Um, like I said, they're pre-charged. They, uh, um, they're gonna, re based on the C state, based on what the IME is telling them, they're gonna release uh, that, the, the charges or, sorry, the pressure to the rams um, based on what our computer's telling it. That's gonna be part of, again, we're, we're gonna get in the service here in a second. Those will be part of your annual services. That's what it looks like with the gyro stripped away. So again there you see you have the hydraulic brake cylinders. Uh, those are hydraulic valves that run up uh, to the manifold and then your, those little globes up there are your accumulators uh, which hold all the charges. And then um, again down here you see those little yellow ports on the hydraulic cylinders. We'll get in that, into that in a second. Um, that's where we're gonna flush and then replace the hydraulic fluid in the cylinders. Coolant. So it's a closed loop coolant system. Uh, we have glycol or 50 50 antifreeze that runs through the sea keeper. It goes through two cooling caps on the top and the bottom of the sphere. They cool down the bearings and then it runs through the, the rest of the housing on the unit. Um, a little more there. And then from there, uh, at this point in the day, we should be pretty knowledgeable about heat exchangers. It runs through a heat exchanger, which then pulls raw water to cool down the coolant. Um, so we're going to go from there. So there's a nice little diagram here of the external cooling. This is the raw water pool. So from it, we have uh, the raw water pickup, which runs through the sea strainer. And then from there, you're gonna go to the sea water pump. That pump then goes up here to our uh, heat exchanger, where it cools down the glycol, then the overboard discharge. Um, not a really a whole lot to it. If a customer calls you say, hey, you know, I'm having cooling issues, you know what I'm saying, I'm getting overheating on the sea keeper. If it's readily available and they can check it, like, again, like the other heat exchangers, go check the strainer, make sure you didn't suck up a bag or anything's clogging in there. And then for most of the units, uh, they should have an automatic relay that turns on the seawater pump. Some units don't. Yeah, it really depends on who installed it. So sometimes maybe you turn on the sea keeper, but you didn't turn on the pump. Go check that. And if the pump is on, you're still not getting anything, the strainer's clear, then maybe it's time for a new pump. Now, uh, up until this point, I think everybody in this room should be an expert on zincs, right? Zincs are very important, right? Good, yeah, they're very important on sea keepers too. So with our pencil zincs, they're located on the heat exchanger. Uh, something important to note here is there are only pencil zincs on the sea keeper six and above. The sea keeper two and the sea keeper three, the heat exchanger is made of cooper nickel which makes it not necessary for a sacrificial, an external sacrificial anode. So again, Sea Keeper 6 and above, there are pencil zincs. Um, on average, we suggest every three months or 150 hours, unscrew them. Once it's 20% or a quarter of what it once was, screw no one in. Um, we should ship two to three new zincs from the factory. And I think since last November, every new unit that has shipped from the factory, on the nice white heat exchanger, there's a big red sticker that points to the pencil zincs and says zinc. This is uh, outside of kind of what I call the eyeball test. This is the only routine maintenance on the sea keeper is your pencil zinc. So please keep up with them. The service guys will be happy. So your displays, so this is a new five inch touchscreen display. We started shipping in last fall. Um, so again, any, any un new units coming out will have this display. The importance of this slide is what screen we're on. We're on the information screen and you get there by pressing that middle button, information button at the bottom. When you're on the phone with Seakeeper Service, this is the screen they're going to ask you to pull up. What they're going to want to know is the model, they want to know the serial number, and then your run hours and sea hours. Um, and an important note here on your run hours and sea hours, why we ask for that, is that is, goes into your warranty. With all of our recreational units, it's a two-year, 2,000 sea hour warranty. So what that means is your run hours is whenever there is power to the unit, whenever there's power to the gyro. Your sea hours, which is part of your warranty, is when it's actually stabilizing the boat. So that's something important there. That's why the service guys are going to call you and ask you to go to, the, to this display. Alarms and warnings. Um, so this comes up, again, if there's any alarms or warnings, there's something going on with the units, it'll throw a, throw a code at you. I have both the, the old display here and our new 5-inch touchscreen display. This is what the screen will look like when something happens. When it does come up, uh, it'll usually kind of give you a couple steps for, for troubleshooting or see if you can get through something. 
again, uh, your only the only routine maintenance something will come up that you can really check is the sea strainer and make sure your sea water pump for the the heat exchanger is on. Besides that, if we have anything to do with the hydraulic rams or the accumulators or anything, we're going to have to get a Seakeeper Tech or a Seakeeper Certified Dealer uh, out there to the boat to diagnose it. So with each warning or code that flashes up, there's a nice little number that goes directly to our Seakeeper service. You'll be able to call in. Most likely you'll get on the phone with Aaron, who I introduced you to earlier, or Alex. They'll get you to the screen. We'll talk through the code, see what you're throwing. And then from there, we'll determine, like I said, if you're in warranty, more than likely we're going to get a CQ for a uh, factory tech out to you. Uh, out of warranty, we'll probably get one of our dealers come out to you. Maintenance and warrant, uh, warranty, again. So your routine maintenance, get everything up on the screen here. The only physical routine maintenance you have is that pencil zinc. That's the only thing you gotta, you got to unscrew, again, three months or 150 hours on average. Um, if you're in a marina that's a little bit hotter, has a little bit more electrolysis, maybe check it once a month. Well, that's the only thing you physically have to do. Outside of that routine maintenance is with the glycol, if you uh, go back and remember the picture I had when we are going over the zincs, there's a clear tube that's over the heat exchanger that the glycol runs through. Just always make sure that has a constant flow of glycol. Um, and you can unscrew the lid on the heat exchanger as well and just make sure it's always filled. Besides that, you know, like I said, if you, you can get salt water all over the unit, you know, most 40s out there, they're going to be in the cockpit. You know, and if you go out and you catch 20 fish, you know, 20 sails a day and you're constantly in reverse, you're going to get the sea keeper soaked. That's not something to freak out about. When you get back to the dock, remember, everything inside the sphere is protected. That's what we're really caring about. When you get back to the dock, open up the lid and just spray it down with fresh water. And again, everything else up here, I just kind of, you know, it's stuff that you guys see all over the boat that you're really used to. Um, I call it the eyeball test. Just make sure nothing's really corroded or has rust all over it. Make sure, you know, with uh, what I tell a lot of people, especially if something's in the engine room and it's mounted on the stringers, make sure nothing's slid underneath the sea keeper and now it, the sea keeper's rubbing against it. When it's precessing, you're starting to get wear and tear on the unit or one of its hoses. So you just kind of do a, a coverall on it. Everything looks fine and more likely it's fine. Again, if you have any questions, our service team is always available. And so uh, as we're getting towards the end here is we have a scheduled maintenance PDF. Uh, what's on this PDF is a lot of what, what I've already covered. I have it available. I think we're going into a break after this. You can come out. I'm at my laptop at the table and say, hey, Nick, can you mind mailing me in that scheduled maintenance PDF? I'll do, I'll do that right then and there. Um, again, what it's going to go over is our suggested inspections and annual replacements. Pencil zinc is the biggest thing. Annually, about every thousand hours, we want to go through, we want to flush out that glycol, uh, replace it. We want to flush out all the hydraulic fluid in those brake cylinders. We want to replace the hydraulic fluid, take a look at the accumulators, make sure they're still doing fine. And then on the hydraulic cylinders, there's rubber bushings. We want to come out and replace those rubber bushings. Um, Typically, on average, from what I see with my dealers, is one of these annual maintenances, what we call them, takes anywhere from the draw circle around four to six hours. Um, so, you know, whatever the going rate for whoever's coming to service the gyro, four to six hours, and then obviously any parts necessary are on top of it. Um, and this is what the rest of the PDF looks like. It goes through the cooling system again. It just gives you suggested time intervals um, to check and fill or to change it or just to inspect. And we have, we all of us have this available. Our dealers have it. You can, you know, just call somebody and ask. We'll get it to you. Something nice, maybe if you're selling a boat, has a CD on it. So you don't have to put in the package with the boat. And again, so with our scheduled maintenance, like I was touching on earlier, outside of checking the coolant and the zinc, um, you need special kits to service the unit. So anybody who's going to be coming out will be a, a sea keeper trained dealer or a sea keeper factory technician. And then finally, to, to wrap things up here, the Seakeeper commitment. Um, on all recreational units, we have a two-year, 2,000 C-hour warranty. Remember that? And on our HD products, we have a four-year, 4,000-hour warranty. There are extended warranties available. Um, again, reliable. We try to keep things as simple as possible. We want you guys to enjoy it. You know, the key is to get out there and have, help people enjoy voting more. Uh, so we try to keep it as maintenance-free. And then finally, uh, again, right there, we have a 24-7 helpline. So 
So no matter where you're at, no matter where your customer's at in the world, they can call this helpline. It could be 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to talk to our factory tech, Ben, in Singapore. You know, but somebody's going to pick up the phone, and we're going to walk you through it. And uh, that's it. Let's see any questions. Good afternoon. We go. Um, I'm Christian Schoenfeld, Engineering Manager from Quantum, and I'm going to focus on pin stabilizers. Who is Quantum? You're probably all familiar with pins, but Quantum, potentially not. Uh, we've got our headquarters just at Marina Mile here in Fort Lauderdale. We also have a sister company in the Netherlands that not only designs and fabricates, as well as a service center we have in Fort Lauderdale and one in the Netherlands to cover the globe. What do we do? Um, we have approximately a thousand systems in use. The boats that we tend to go and have our systems on varies between 30 and 200 meters. Um, the markets that we're in, we tend to be on the larger side of vessels because hydraulics, there's a lot more stored energy in hydraulics than, for example, in the electric stabilizers. And as you can see, about 85% of the yachts between 55 and 200 meters have quantum stabilizers on them. Besides fins, I'm going to briefly touch a couple of other products in case you're not familiar with them. We have the zero speed fins. Zero speed fins is probably the most popular product. The advantage, as you can see, it has a foil section over here, which is ideal for zero speed. So the anchor, fin area at the trailing edge of the fin is the most crucial. Why? Because you have a moment, and this area represents around 30% increase in the area for the fin, and that equates to potentially around 50 to 70% increase in lift capacity, therefore stabilizing the vessel better. Here's a quick representation of what we have. This is a 7.5 square meter fin. Once it extends, it goes to 9.6 square .6 meters. This is just a typical example. We also make magnet rotors. Rotors, you might not be familiar with them. Um, one of the largest yachts in the world has these on there. The magnets we make range from 180 millimeters diameter to about 600 diameter, just in shaft. But again, I'm not going to focus on this. Um, this is what the rotor looks like. It extends from the vessel and then spins for zero speed applications, which is ideal, as well as for loitering speed. A relatively new product we launched about two years ago is a Dynafoil. It's a combination between a rotor and a fin. Um, this system uh, is new in that um, it actually creates its own momentum. It's basically a foil that instead of moving up and down, which is traditional, it moves sideways as well as pivots. So it's ideal for situations where you end up having to have a stabilizer system, a large one, but you don't want it to extend outside the beam and the baseline of the vessel because it can tuck in nicely under the underside. It's ideal for zero speed as well as underway. a quick representation of what that looks like uh, under the vessel, and then I'll move on. The hydraulic power pack that operates it in the system. One thing I wanted to touch on is something that you may or may not be aware of in terms of maintenance. The roll period of a vessel is probably the most influential part that's going to determine how much wear and tear you have on any stabilizer system. The question is, why? Now let me tell you a bit about roll periods. Any vessel's roll period is potentially between 4 and 15 seconds. 
So if somebody tells me after the boat with a roll period of two seconds, I assure you, it's no yacht. You're dealing with a dinghy. And if somebody tells you, you have a, I have a yacht with a roll period of 18 seconds, can't be either. You're dealing with a floating island here. This is pure physics. Roll periods are between 4 and 14 seconds of any vessel that's of a yacht size. So, imagine you have two yachts next to each other. One, two yachts exactly the same length, same beams, same displacement. One has a roll period of 6 seconds, well, the other one has a roll period of 12 seconds. Why are they different? Because of the loading conditions as well as the GM on the vessel. So you can imagine a vessel with six seconds has to work twice as hard in terms of the stabilization to go and maintain this vessel at rest. Where a vessel with 12 seconds has a lot less wear and tear on the system. Why? Because the bearings don't have to work as hard. The one system has to work twice as hard as the other. And for that reason, it is very difficult if you have two vessels from the outside they might seem identical to actually compare it and say the maintenance cost of this vessel is so much that. Why? Because the roll period has such a big impact on it. It might be worth mentioning when we go and work with uh, owners and yacht builders, we take the roll period and we obviously accommodate our system design accordingly. When it comes to service, we typically break things into two parts. One is onboard maintenance, and the other one is depot. Onboard are relatively minor things you can do. We have work instructions for that. We have YouTube videos of how to do these things. When it comes to onboard maintenance, sorry, when you do depot maintenance, that's when we request you to go and call us. We basically, what happens is that the vessel is either in dry dock or on the key side, and we have specialized tools as well as specialized trained personnel that deal with it. Cylinder bearings. So I'm going to go into a couple of details here. Cylinder bearings over here, those bearings basically take all the loading for the actuators and transfer those loads over to the tiller, which is the part over here, which transfers the loads to your shaft, which then basically moves the fin and displaces the vessel to accommodate roll. The bearings that we have are specially designed for quantum because they take a huge amount of loading. Um, the bearings are designed in such a way, we call them tapered bearings. Uh, they have special sleeves in them. They have a special mechanism to actually tighten them up so that you get the maximum life out of them. We can actually prolong the life of a bearing and to prevent wear and tear in them, as well as noises. Typically, when a bearing starts having a lot of fatigue, you start hearing it. With the expanded system as we have, you expand the inner race of the bearing and you take away that noise. I mentioned earlier the difference between the 6 second roll period and the 12 second roll period. Just to go and put this a bit more into practical um, applications, if you have a bearing, and that bearing ends up working for a year, on a typically quantum stabilizer, that bearing is going to rotate 1.8 million times within a year. That's for the 6 second roll period. For the 12 second roll period, that bearing is only going to rotate 900,000 times. So you have twice as much wear on the same system. One thing I wanted to go and mention, this is in general, uh, anodes. I know there was a lot of talk about zincs. I'm going to call them anodes, and for a very good reason. Technically, zincs are legal to be used. Zinc-based anodes. Anodes should be aluminum. Since 2013, there's a new directive, and most of the clients we service are very, very aware of this, that all the anodes feed on stabilizers, that means predominantly on fins in this case, and the cooling water systems have to be aluminum-based. From our experience, the aluminum actually works slightly better even as well. 
And that's the new BPG, which is determined by the EPA. Greeting. Um, typically, stabilizer systems need to be greased. You have multiple bearings on the system. Um, apologies. Down here, depending on what kind of stabilizer you have, some stabilizer companies use water to go with the sleeve bearing at the base. Quantum uses grease. We have a single grease point that greases the upper part and the bottom part in one. When it comes to the type of grease that you use, again, because of the, the new regulations from the EPA, that grease needs to be environmentally friendly. It might be worth mentioning as well, in terms of lubricants, not only grease, but hydraulic oil. Every vessel built since two, where the keel was laid since 2013 needs to apply to these new rules. That includes all vessels that actually come into U.S. waters or reside in U.S. waters. So far, we haven't seen any enforcing of it, but any new builders are very, very aware of this and constantly ask us questions of us. When a system is slightly older, it should also be upgraded to new type of greases or oils, unless it's technically infeasible. In that case, we provide a letter on all the systems where we say due to certain reasons, be it the material of the bearings, the material of the O-rings, it's not feasible, then the EPA should be able to accept that. Hydraulic oil, we also do sampling. Our system is such that if you see any contamination showing up in the sample, it usually goes back to only one component, and that's the hydraulic pump. The pump is the only one that has certain heavy metals or coppers that the rest of the system wouldn't have. It's a good indicator of something would go wrong, but it is not a good indicator for anything else besides the pump, from my experience. When it comes to hydraulic system, what really is key is the fact that you filter the system well. That's for any system. You have usually typical three filters. You have a suction filter, basically from your reservoir, where it sucks into the pump. That's the suction strainer. You have a pressure filter. The pressure filter is the filter that takes out the most, and it's the most... Um, um, it has the highest degree of purity that allows the oil to come out of it. That pressure filter um, needs to be replaced at every 2,000 hours. And then once the oil is consumed after the consumers, it goes back into the system, we have a return filter. If you ever have water in the system, there are filters available that take some sort of oil out of the system, sorry, some sort of water out of the oil as well. Keep in mind that hydraulic oil is hydroscopic. You're always going to have a certain percentage of water anyway. Pumps. The pump on any hydraulic system is eventually going to fail. Pump manufacturers recommend replacing of the pump between somewhere between 10 and 20,000 hours. Based on the manufacturers, we also recommend that pumps be replaced at around 10,000 hours, give or take. The pumps itself, we have certain clients where failure is not an option. We have military clients, we have commercial clients, we have charter clients. As well as what we've seen in the last two, three years, we have a lot of explorer vessels where failure is not an option as well. They tend to go further afield into the rather remote areas for 18 months and say, we want to make sure the system runs smoothly and that's one of the things we focus on then as well. Hoses. Hoses is one of those things that's very easy to maintain and to replace, but yet often enough we see people also ignore it. A general rule of thumb for any hydraulic system, after 10 years in service or on the shelf, throw it away. Do not use them. Hoses, they get hard, they get brittle, they start blistering. These things are very often you cannot see with the naked eye, but you'll start seeing it once it gets put into service. 
So the general rule of thumb, replace them after 10 years. Here's just a couple of examples of those hoses. Another thing to keep in mind are suppressors, dampeners, and silencers. These systems, if they're done, if the level's maintained, the system's still going to run, but it's going to run loud. I can't tell you of how many instances we have. We just had one the other day where of a mega yacht, even the owner came on board. We had a, they hired a sound engineer. The captain was on board, the ship engineer was on board, and they called us and said, why is the system so loud? One of the first things we did was check the system, and the suppressors were not charged. We charged the suppressor, everybody's happy, and everybody went home a half an hour later. These are components that are often overlooked. They're usually set to about 60% of operating pressure, and you keep them around 60%, depending on the system, they're going to make a huge fundamental difference to the system. I also show the accumulators here. We often come across vessels where they don't get charged as well. The system is still going to function, but it's going to function sluggishly. These accumulators are stored energy. You take them out of the system because they don't operate. What are they going to do? They're going to start drawing on your generators. If these are not properly charged, in worst case, you're going to start seeing light dimming within your vessel. One of the things that I want to stress, and that is probably the cheapest insurance you can have, is do good inspection. If you do a visual inspection of the system, look for any loose components, nuts and bolts. Look for leaks. A leak is a good indicator that something's about to fail. Look for chafing. If you've got chafing hoses, you're looking for trouble. Chafing hoses, if you ever had a, electric, a hydraulic hose burst, it is an incredible mess. Besides being dangerous. And one thing that often gets overlooked as well is check your electrical wiring regularly. The vessel has a lot of vibrations on board, besides the heave, the sway, and the roll that we try to take out of the system. Electric wires come loose with time. We've seen instances where even high powered electric motors burn out because electrical wires came loose or were never properly tightened in the first place. In terms of maintenance, we have haul out. Typically what we see that most boat owners do, they follow the Lloyd's five-year guideline, which means the vessel gets hauled out after five years in service. That for us is an ideal time to go and inspect the system. We typically take off the fins, we inspect the shafts, we inspect seals. This is when we start replacing seals, we're replacing O-rings, we replace bearings. If the system has been well maintained and well greased, there should be very little work to be, to be replaced. When systems do not get greased very well, that's when we see that the shaft component of the hull unit has a lot of wear and tear on it. And that becomes very expensive and is very unnecessary as well. Five years, typically, to give you an indicator, you're looking at around eight to 10,000 hours. People often ask me, what does that really equate to? And I'll try to explain it to them in terms of a car. If you spend 10,000 hours in a car, you're going to have done about 300,000 miles. So that's when we basically have our first major service. And as a conclusion, um, again, I want to stress visual inspection. Visual inspections take a little bit of time, they cost virtually nothing, and it is usually a good indicator of what needs to be replaced or looked after. And that means that ends my recommendation. Thank you.